All right, Jonathan, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Thanks a lot for having me back on. Absolutely. Uh, how'd the move to the new flat go? Uh, very well. Uh, I'm talking to you from the from the new pad now, so pretty uh, pretty chuffed with it. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, thank you for joining us during this international break. Um, it's been a busy international break, so we had a few questions that we wanted to throw your way, and, and we really appreciate you being here. So uh, first, we wanted to ask about Thomas Tuchel, who gave an interview to be in sports. He was interviewed by Darren Toulet, and um, he talked a lot about Neymar, and he talked about that aftermath uh, of the loss to Manchester United in the Champions League last season. Um, in your opinion, what was the most eye-opening thing that you learned from that interview? Um, I think there were quite a few interesting things uh, thrown up from that. Uh, I'd, I'd say for me, probably the most interesting part of it was his feelings uh, regarding sort of the, the Manchester United match. You know, how he said he was he was feeling sort of in the build up to that, how he saw the players uh, and how he felt they were they, like they were almost overdoing it because that feeds into, uh, you know, a lot of what we have, have, have sort of come to feel about this this team over the last couple of years, particularly when it comes to the Champions League. That there's almost too much emphasis on these big games and it's almost, uh, you know, all or nothing. And, it you know, it defines the season and, you know, it leaves people who follow PSG with this feeling of frustration that basically the season only lasts up until sort of around March time when PSG have, you know, have contrived to, to go out in the last couple of years. So I, I've, I found that very interesting and I'd be very keen to see, uh, you know, sort of how he remedies that if and when PSG reach the, the latter stage of the Champions League, obviously with the way things are going at the moment, that things are looking very good. So fingers crossed, uh, touch on wood that, uh, you know, that continues. Uh, but, I, I I think I got the impression from from that interview with Tuchel that he learned a lot of things in his first year in charge, um, and that preparation, big match preparation, is something that he wants to work on coming into this season. And you look at the way that PSG uh, have gone into their biggest matches uh, of the campaign so far, and you'd have to say that you know he seems to have learned that lesson. Uh, and is is doing a good job of it so far, particularly uh, with regards to the Champions League, because I don't think anyone could really fault uh, the way that he got the the team ready for that that uh, win over Real Madrid at home. Uh, otherwise, I was also very interested by what he had to say about Neymar, although that segment uh, came out, I think, about a week or so in advance of the the rest of the interview, so everyone had a bit more time to chew over that than uh, than the rest of it. Uh, I I thought it was very interesting how he you know sort of wasn't in everyday context with Neymar regarding you know him potentially leaving or not um, but that they both agreed that it was in their best interests to keep their relationship just the two of them uh, you know always very positive you know that sort of uh, explains why Tuchel seemed to be sort of like holding out hope uh, over the summer that PSG wouldn't cave in and sell uh, Neymar you know he kept that door open for him all the time and uh, you know I think we definitely see uh, you know how Tuchel is reaping the benefits of um, you know maintaining that good relationship with Neymar now that Neymar is back in action uh, you know and is scoring important goals it's uh, you know it's really worked out for him and you know I think it's also worked out for Neymar it was a a smart move on uh, on, on his part to you know not burn all of his bridges completely uh, because at the end of the day you know if there's one person you really want to keep on your side in a situation like that it's the it's the coach and Tuchel was very clear when he arrived at PSG that Neymar would be his key man and okay now uh, when he is fit uh, and, and back in the team you know PSG have a second star man in Kylian Mbappe but uh, you know, Neymar is still very much, uh, you know, at the forefront of, uh, of PSG's plans because Tuchel maintained that relationship with him over the summer. So I'd, I'd say those were probably my my two most interesting takeaways from that interview, which which I thought was a very good one. Yeah, I agree too. Um, fantastic interview. And you were around the club uh, during that Champions League run last season. Did you kind of get a sense of what Tuchel was talking about, where the the team seemed to be trying? extra hard that like they, they were just too much in their own heads did you kind of get that feeling when you were, were observing training uh, it's not so much when you're observing training because the players are always quite light-hearted at the sessions that the press are allowed into I and mean, we only get 15 minutes at the very beginning so the players are you know kind of horsing around normally joking okay. about doing a bit of warm-ups but uh you know i i do see what what Tuchel was talking about and i think that's probably why i found that part of the interview so interesting uh because it does feel like uh, you know the players before the game 
particularly, you know, they get very, very serious. Uh, I mean, I get, I guess, you know, this comes back to this whole have PSG been professional enough over the last couple of years, which, you know, obviously, uh, you know, with Leonardo returning as sporting director, he feels that they haven't been approaching things as professionally as they could do over the last couple of years and is now trying to remedy that. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with him. Uh, I'd say that it, it felt quite obvious that the players kind of perked up around those big Champions League encounters, took it very seriously. Uh, especially before, I mean, for example, you know, look at the before the first leg of the Manchester United match. You know, I think that worked uh, to perfection. And even if Tuchel was was feeling sort of that way, uh, you know, ahead of that match as well as the return leg, uh, you know, I think that actually worked in his favour that time because the players were motivated to make a point. But you know, it's it's such a um, that that. You know, those two legs in particular against Manchester United, it's it, it's a very particular case because I feel that things worked out so brilliantly in the first leg and so disastrously in the second leg. You know, there's still a lot of questions up in the air why certain decisions were or were not made. Um, but, you know, the, the, the fact remains from that first leg that, you know, Thomas Tuchel designed a, a tactical system that worked to perfection with the players that were available for that match. Uh, and utilize players who were not a hundred percent fit uh you know and those those gambles that he took paid off the players were motivated enough to perform that night and then they weren't uh you know for for the return leg at home and you know obviously uh, you know it's another another embarrassing exit that was suffered so you know i definitely think that there is a lot of truth in in, in what Tuchel was saying uh, and i do think that when you're in and around the club like i am most of the time that you do get this feeling that the the, the players put great to emphasis on those big matches um, and you know actually I think that that's another I mean there, there's so there's many reasons why it worked out very well for PSG to play Real Madrid first in this this year's uh, this season's group stage and one of those reasons was that because it came so early in the season and neither side was completely ready for a clash of that of that magnitude uh, it meant that the players didn't have as much time to sort of overanalyze things before the match, uh, and you know, and I think that's why they were able to put in such a, uh, you know, such a good performance. And it's, it, you know, if the, if they can continue to do that, I mean, we'll see how they approach the match when it comes to to playing the return leg against Real in Madrid, which is going to be particularly interesting considering that Real have dropped even more points, uh, you know, since they met in Paris, and now PSG could actually go to Madrid not get anything uh, yeah. and still finish top of the group, which, uh, you know, is, is is a possibility when you're going up against a team of Real Madrid's, uh, you know, quality. But at this moment in time, you know, they do still street, seem to have, you know, quite a few issues uh, going on over there. So we'll see how, how Tuchel handles the players and whether they whether they perk up around that fixture. Uh, and then obviously the, the real acid test of, of what Tuchel was talking about will come in the in the latter stages, but PSG have to have to get there first. However, things have started uh, very very well and like I said yeah. I do feel that that Tuchel has has learned from that and is now trying to handle the players better so fingers crossed you know we will see less of the the, the players sort of building up these big clashes in their own minds uh, you know and sort of treating even the biggest matches you know just as any other game really. So it sounds like what you're saying, the key to winning the Champions League is to put the players kind of in a cone of silence when they do the draw for the knockout stage so that they have no idea that they're playing Manchester City. And then the day before, we just spring it on them and say, hey, you're playing Manchester, Manchester City tomorrow. Good luck. And they'll be just fine. It's not, it's not so much that. I mean, I think that, uh, you know... PSG around the time of the when when the latter stages of the Champions League start are always playing a lot of games. Uh, you know, some people would argue too many. Some people would argue that it's a good thing that they're playing. Uh, you know, so many matches. Uh, I I'm in the I'm I'm with those people who say they're probably playing a bit too many. So not not necessarily because I'm against a competition like the Coupe de la Ligue, more because I'm against the way that it's scheduled because it is, you know, suicidal sort of the, you know, the January to March run. It's just it's crazy. And although it will be a shame to see something like the Coupe de la Ligue go, uh, it won't be a shame to, to see the, the schedule eased up around that that period of the season. We know that it's it's rich uh, in, in injuries normally. So for, for me, I'd, I'd say that it's not so much about Tuchel sort of you know, springing a surprise on the on the players and saying like, oh yeah, by the way, you know, it's it's one of the biggest matches of the season coming up in a couple of days' time. Uh, it's more that you know the the players are sort of used to playing every sort of between three and five days, uh, and 
don't I mean okay you know they're not going to treat every single match exactly the same but they don't put this over emphasis on uh the the big champions league matches and this under emphasis on uh you know league matches uh against anyone by you know the exceptions of like the, the likes of marseille uh, or Lyon. so you know i think it's it, it's sort of keeping the players calm when it comes to to those big matches but then again uh you know PSG may well benefit from a from a slightly more favourable uh, Champions League latter stage draw this this season if they do end up finishing top of the group, which looks uh, you know like a distinct possibility at this moment in time, and that's something that we haven't seen uh, for the last couple of years. So you know there's a lot to be decided yet uh, in this mm-hmm. uh, in this season, but it does seem like Tuchel you know is handling the players in the the right way at the moment, but. Uh, you know, because Real Madrid has been the biggest match of the season so far, it could just be, uh, you know, the the fact that it, you know, worked out well in terms of timing. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens when they when they go to Madrid uh, next month. Absolutely. And hopefully he rotates the squad a little bit. I mean, we got the squad depth. Hopefully people will come back from injury. And so for a match in the Coupe de Liga, hopefully he can play some of the youngsters and give some of the first team uh, players a little bit of a rest. So that would be good. And just one more thing on the interview. I thought that the way Tuchel described the loss to Manchester United as kind of getting hit from, you know, a car wreck, someone hitting you from the side, just totally not even expecting it is exactly the way I would have described it. Um, So yeah, and I thought that, you know, he was like talking about how he would drop his kids off at school and he was hearing his neighbors all talking about the match. And it just kind of gives you an insight into the life of a manager where, you know, everywhere you go, people are questioning you and judging and every result. And I don't envy him, especially after that loss. I'm sure, he, I think he said he like hidden in a dark room for like three days or something. So <laughs> you really feel bad yeah. for the guy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think as well, one of the, the, the best things about that interview, I mean, especially for us as uh, as, as native, in, native English speakers, is, you know, the fact that he was able to express himself better. You know, he's, he's obviously more at ease when he's speaking in English and to, you know, to hear him going into into quite, you know, quite great length uh, over, over certain topics was, uh, you know, very interesting, very refreshing, uh, you know, and I think it reminded people as well of, uh, you know, just how uh, much of a thinker he is, uh, you know, regarding uh, regarding the football, because I think a lot, uh, a lot, a lot of the positives that surround Tuchel um, were lost towards the end of last season when, you know, the team just went into massive nosedive mode after, after that loss uh, to United. So, you know, I think the beginning of this season, particularly since the the transfer window closed, has been a, a good reminder to people about uh, you know why PSG chose um, Tuchel to you know to, to sort of lead this next phase of the project, uh, and that interview uh, you know also reminded people why you know PSG were very keen to, to to keep him on despite a disastrous last season. Fantastic. So just moving along here to our next topic, um, I was looking at a photo gallery on the PSG website. And so they had Cavani was in training on Thursday. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you expect to see him in the squad against uh, Nice when the team all returns on October 18th? And if so, would you go ahead and start Cavani or Icardi? He's got two goals here um, right before the international break. Um, And it appears that I read a report that Neymar does prefer playing with Icardi. I don't know how truthful that is, but your thoughts on Cavani? Will he be back? Do you think he'll start over Icardi? Just general thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, I think a lot depends on how how Cavani is feeling. Uh, you know, once all of the internationals come back from from international break, uh, I mean, it's good to see that he's been training, but he's been training for a while now. And I think the most worrying thing is what Tuchel said. Uh, I think it was just ahead of the the Angers match uh, in in press conference where he said that it's basically Cavani saying to him and his staff that he doesn't quite feel ready to make his return yet, despite the fact that they don't really have any more concerns over his fitness or what they're seeing from him in training, which, uh, you know, does beg the question as to whether this has started to become, you know, sort of a bit of a mental issue for Cavani, because it is, has now been sort of like the last 12 to 18 months where he's been struggling with uh, these injuries, many of them, many of them muscular. And I think, you know, that's normal for somebody who's, uh, you know, um, approaching the stage of, of their career that the Cavani is. Um, but I think if he feels ready to get back into action against Nice uh, after the international break, then yes, uh, you know, I think Tuchel should involve him. I think it would be foolish um, of, of Tuchel to sort of try and settle on a on a front three that might or might not include um, Cavani and, and sort of keep um 
you know, one, maybe one one striker getting less uh, getting less game time because as we've seen at the beginning of this season, there's no real guarantees over the fitness of any of PSG's attacking players, and I think it's in his best interest to try and keep all of those players as fit as possible. Um, Icardi doesn't need as much work now as he did when he arrived. Uh, you know, he's starting to look a, a bit sharper. That doesn't mean that he's you know 100% just yet, uh, but you know, Tuchel is going to have to find a way to try and get Kylian Mbappe back into into the fold, uh, as well as Cavani, uh, you know, and also keep Neymar ticking over. Obviously, it's going to help now that Neymar's Champions League ban is uh, is over. He'll be back for the, the match against Club Brugge. Uh, so, you know, he can almost, I, I wouldn't say be wrapped in cotton well ahead of that, that, that game, but that can be prioritised in terms of Neymar. So it wouldn't surprise me if he maybe gets, you know, handed a breather in, in Ligue 1 somewhere, perhaps not against Nice, uh, but in one of the other in one of the other matches in and around uh, the the Champions League clash uh, uh, in Belgium, whether it's before or after, you know, I we'll have to wait and see. But I th- I think if Cavani is, uh, is is fit and ready to go against Nice, that it would be a good idea for Tuchel to try and bring him back uh, into into the thick of it as quickly as possible. Um, and goes without saying as well that you know Mbappe is come, is is going to need to get back to. Uh, full fitness uh, as, as quickly as possible to make up for lost time uh, since the beginning of the season. But it's it, it's strange how the the beginning of this season has gone for for PSG in terms of in terms of injuries and you know it makes the the signing of Icardi on loan uh, late in the transfer window seem even more of a masterstroke when you consider that even uh, Chubo Moting has uh, you know had had a few fitness issues as well over the last yeah. couple of weeks. Yeah, Cardi is very much the shiny new object, isn't he? Where he's co- scored a couple goals and fans are like, oh, he's got to go in over Cavani. And people forget Cavani, even though he is in a little bit later stage of his career and he does have the energy when injury when he is on. I mean, he can he can bang in goals for you. I mean, he can get the job done. He loves the club and this could be very well be his last season. So he he's inclined to probably give everything he has left in the tank. Whereas Icardi is kind of sort of like a ticking time bomb. We don't really know when him and his agent uh, slash wife or maybe cause some trouble. So it would be wise for Tuchel to definitely keep Cavani, in my opinion, keep him in the fold, give him some game time. We may need him later in the season. I mean, I think referencing what you said as well about Neymar preferring to play with Icardi, uh, you know, I read those reports as well. Uh, It wouldn't surprise me completely if he does prefer playing with Icardi strictly from a from a technical point of view, because Cavani is not the most technical of players. But as you said, uh, you know, Cavani is somebody who gives 100 percent on the pitch. And I don't think it matters, uh, you know, this uncertainty over over his future, whether he's going to get a new contract or not. I don't think that's going to stop. Edinson Cavani being Edinson Cavani on the pitch, you know, he's going to continue to try to give everything. But I think that's also perhaps, uh, you know, part of the problem now with Cavani. He keeps trying to be the player that he's been over the last couple of Mm -hmm. years and his body can no longer support that. So he's going to have to be smart and try to, you know, figure out how to manage himself so that he doesn't, uh, you know, keep wearing himself out and giving himself, uh, you know, a lot of injuries. Kind of reminds me a bit of uh, Rafael Nadal in tennis, how Nadal's playing style, you know, wore him out. And he went through a period of his career where he picked up a lot of injuries and then seemed to, have t- seemed to take that on board, managed himself a bit better, stayed relatively injury free and enjoyed almost a, a second wind in his career. And you wonder whether that, you know, is perhaps mm-hmm. something that could happen for Cavani for the final few years of his career, whether or not that's, uh, you know, in Paris with PSG, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but the most important thing for him and for PSG right now is that, that he gets back onto the pitch because this is a, a, a crucial couple of months for him because, you know, if he continues to, to not feel like he can get back on the pitch, uh, you know, and try and work his way back to to full fitness. Uh, You know, that sort of potential mental block that's been building up is just going to get bigger and bigger. And it's, you know, it's unlike somebody like Cavani to be, to be phased mentally by anything. So I, I doubt that, you know, he is um, sort of keeping himself away from the pitch for fear of getting injured again. Uh, I, I think that this is perhaps a moment where he recognises that he can no longer continue to play in the style that he was playing before, uh, knows that he needs to change and to, uh, you know, to sort of hold himself back every every now and then. I mean, in terms of in terms of their finishing, you know, both Cavani and, and Icardi are, are very predatory players, uh, you know, 
Icardi has scored a couple of very Cavani-esque goals so far, uh, you know, which is, you know, bodes very well because at the end of the day, you know, this could, this, this, this Icardi loan is, is almost a, a trial period for him right. uh, mm-hmm. to prove that he would be worthy of, of following in Cavani's footsteps so far. That's, you know, so good. We'll have to wait and see how it pans out over the course of the season. Um, you know, but I, I, I can see why Neymar, would prefer to play alongside somebody who is, uh, you know, who who at the end of the day has greater technical ability uh, than Cavani. But then again, uh, you know, some people favour, you know, work rate over over technique, and you know that Cavani has in abundance. Absolutely. And you mentioned that Cavani's hip injury, I believe it is, it may at this point be more mental. And another player um, who's kind of been accused of having a, a mental injury issue as well was Mbappe. I think there was a doctor who just came out recently and said he he may have something like a phantom injury where there's nothing really wrong. It's just kind of all in his head. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on the latest on Mbappe. I mentioned that photo gallery that was on the, the PSG website um, from training and all of the photos were of like Diallo and Cavani and and Draxler and all these players that are coming back from injury and Mbappe was nowhere to be seen in, except for the very last photo and it was just Mbappe like sticking his head out of the door and that was it was very like <laughs> ominous so I'm just curious have you seen him at all around training how does he look um, and I also wanted to ask about the new medical staff something we've talked about before but have you noticed anything different is there a different approach being taken? I yeah, I mean, with, uh, with 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 Mbappe, I mean, I think one thing we have to remember is that he is still very, very young. You know, this is uh, o- only a few people really seem to have mentioned that this is the first major injury that he's suffered in his career. So, you know, I think I think Mbappe is entitled to be a little a little scared, a little worried by this because at the end of the day, you know, he's not used to his body saying no. You know, mm-hmm. I'm I'm not in a I'm not in a fit state to to play at the moment. Uh, you know, so I. You, you can see that he's desperate to get back on the pitch, uh, you know, really, really wanted to be involved with, with PSG just before the international break, wanted to be involved with France as well, uh, you know, has had to, to suffer, uh, you know, having to, to sit out for, for both of those. So you'd imagine that he'll be back just after the international break with, with PSG. But I think at the moment, uh, you know, he and the, the, the PSG staff, the, you know, the France staff as well, are, are aware that, uh, you know, he is starting to, you know, to fret a little bit because, you know, this is the, this is the first time, his first time experiencing it. Uh, and it's something, you know, I think that'll, that, you know, that will hold him in good stead for the, for, for the future. I, I don't think he realizes that now. Uh, you know, but it, it's all about experience, and he is constantly uh, gaining experience. And you know, when he's sort of in his mid twenties, uh, you know, this sort of injury won't phase him. You know, he'll probably be a lot calmer uh, in terms of, of of how he handles himself in when he's trying to get back to to fitness. Uh, and in that, you know, in that sort of scenario, we'll probably actually get back onto the pitch much faster than he has this time. Uh, you know, I think it's solely through, you know, his eagerness to, to get back into action that he's, you know, having to, to suffer this sort of prolonged period of, of having to stay away from uh, from the action. I mean, when you when you see Mbappe around, you know, he's still the, the same guy, very, very jovial, very upbeat, very happy, you know, always joking. Uh, I just think that he feels a bit frustrated right now that, you know, he can't be with the guys, uh, you know, as he's so used to. I mean, especially when you think back to last season when everybody else in attack was getting injured and he wasn't. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of a bit strange for him, I think, at the moment for the for the shoe to be on the other foot. I, I mean, PSG's medical staff have been changing over the last couple of months, uh, changing for the better, I might add. Uh, but, you know, there's still... I mean, when we spoke in the last podcast, I think we discussed a lot of, uh, you know, how the, you know, the, the, the travelling over the summer probably mm-hmm. impacted some of the, the players, you know, the fact that there was the, the Copa America as well. I, you know, I, th- I think... I, I, I still think that, you know, the medical staff had a lot to, to deal with and were bombarded very early on. Uh, you know, and they're still working out exactly where they might need to strengthen. Uh, but, you know, they seem to be being more thorough with the players than, uh, you know, than the medical staff of the past. Uh, you know, and, you know, when there's a when it looks likely that a player needs to be kept out of action, uh, for fear of re-injuring themselves, they do, you know, they keep that player back because PSG now have depth in, you know, pretty much every position on the pitch, which is something that we can't, 
we couldn't say for a lot of the the, the squads over over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, look at the way that the you know Julian Drexler, Tito Kehaya's, um recent injuries have been handled. Uh, you know, they've sort of been kept in house, um, and then when it finally looked like they uh, you know, would need some sort of checkup, uh, you know, to get the best advice possible. They get sent to Aspatar in Qatar. Uh, and I think that it, there seems to be more intelligence about the way that the PSG medical staff are, are going about the, the players' uh, injury uh, treatments uh, since the, you know, since Leonardo's return as sporting director. Uh, okay, it's frustrating at times when, you know, PSG clearly needs someone like Kylian Mbappe on the pitch, but mm-hmm. can't have him. But at the end of the day, people should remind themselves of how frustrating it was to have someone like Javier Pastore who kept getting rushed back onto the pitch, uh, you know, and then would break down and be out for another couple of months. Uh, you know, if players missing a couple more weeks in order to be fit for the remainder of the season is is necessary, you know, then I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, people are just going to have to bite the bullet on. And it seems like the the medical staff are doing the, you know, are doing a good job so far. And it'll be interesting to see once PSG finally have a clean slate of injuries and the squad is completely, uh, you know, fully fit and, and Tuchel has everyone to choose from, how long they can sort of keep the players in, uh, in, in best condition without any major injuries. I think that will be the real test uh, of this new medical stuff. Yeah. One thing they may want to rethink is uh, shooting those videos that was documenting Mbappe's recovery and it had like his ending <laughs> with this momentous return against Bordeaux and he had the assist to... Uh, uh, Neymar, and then he gets injured again, or re-aggravates it, or whatever it is that he did, and it's like, oh, you know, it was kind of a letdown after this like triumphant video that they shot about his recovery. Um, one more. Well, you have to, about- you have to, want, you have to wonder if they're going to rush out another video now for his recovery from his second injury. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so you mentioned Kara. That was one thing I wanted to ask you. Do you see when he does return? Right back seems to be a position that PSG are really light in. Do you see him kind of going more into that role, or do you still see him, him as a center back with this team? Uh, it's well, I mean, it's, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of questions in defense at the moment. You've got Thomas Meunier, who you know every time he gets anywhere close to a microphone, seems to be you know begging for a, for a new contract, and PSG are, are reluctant to, to offer that to him. Uh, you know, there's nothing on the, on the on the table for Thiago Silva at the moment, so that's another potential mm-hmm. spot in defense that is going to open up. Uh, over potentially over the next couple of months, so you know there is maybe a chance for Kerhaer to move to move into central defence, but also at the same time, he, you know, he spent his the majority of his time playing under Tuchel, not playing in the you know the position that we thought he was signed to play in, uh, and now you've had Diallo added to the mix as well. Uh, I my feeling is that I mean, okay, we've seen uh, Colin Dagba have his mm-hmm. um, contract renewed recently. Once he is fit, uh, I, th- I think we'll, we'll see Tuchel persevere with him. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how often he uses Munier, but uh, it, it seems to me that you know Dagbo is a player that, that Tuchel likes very much and will try to utilise as much as possible. I mean, it could all be building towards the January transfer window when PSG potentially make a, uh, a move and have someone like Munier that they might be able to include in a, in a, in a potential deal. I'm just not certain that it would be for uh, you know somebody who, who plays right back. So it could be that mm-hmm. Kerhaer, you know, continues to sort of play there and, and shares game time with someone like Dagba and then Munier gets used, uh, you know, to potentially bring somebody else in. Uh, I don't get the impression at this moment in time that, uh, you know, PSG are too, too fussed uh, about tying him down in the same way that they're not too fussed about tying Thiago Silva or Edinson Cavani down to new deals. Uh, you know, so I think it would have to take something special from Munier a uh, more special than uh, than than the goal against Real Madrid to to convince PSG that you know they want to try and keep him on uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, you know, okay, it's maybe water under the bridge now, but uh, you know he's never really won the fans back since yeah. uh, you know uh, yeah. since all of those fallings out over social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you've got so, you've got somebody as promising as Dagba, uh, and you've got someone as versatile as Kerha, Kerha you know, it, it lessens the, the need for somebody uh, like Munier, and especially if you can potentially, uh, you know, use him as part of a deal to bring somebody else in. Uh, you know, I have to see if that's what more PSG decide to do when the January transfer window comes around. Uh, you know, then it could be a, could be a smart move. Uh, but 
when Kiara gets gets back uh, into you know into the squad and is available to Tuchel again, uh, you know I I don't expect to see him featuring too much in central defence to start with. So we got to ask about Neymar, of course. Um, what I want to know specifically about him is that what is the general feeling around the stadium and maybe even in Paris about Neymar now that he's scored a bunch of goals when since coming back and. Um, he said in the press conferences that he's going to fight tooth and nail for the club. Are you seeing fans starting to warm up to him a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay, I'm not going to say that all of the fans, uh, you know, warm to him uh, to the same degree. But, uh, you know, I think most people have put what happened in the summer behind them now, have accepted that it probably will rear its head again this summer. But I'm just going to try and make the most of it, try and enjoy, uh, you know, this season with him because they know that PSG with him are stronger than they are without uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll we'll let the ultras, you know, treat him the way that the ultras decide to. I mean, I think it was good that they decided they, you know, they would sort of try and vent all of their anger just in one match and then treat him with indifference after that. But I think the way that he's performing, uh, you know, this, you know, when he's coming up as the as as the clutch guy. Uh, in, in games like against Strasbourg, uh, you know, like against Lyon, uh, you know, like against Bordeaux as well. He's it's it's very difficult to argue against uh, a player of his quality. Yeah, we can debate, uh, you know, how he how he handles himself sort of away away from the pitch, but you can't debate that he's a you know he's a top class player on it, uh, and you know he's going about winning the the PSG fans back in the right way, and I think the club recognise that now. That's why you see these sort of sorts of initiatives. Um, you know, with uh, you know the free naming and numbering of the the shirt mm-hmm. when you when you choose Neymar, because you know I think more and more people are probably now feeling like okay, he's going to be staying for this season. I can get this season shirt with his with his name and number on it. Uh, you know, and I think PSG making that sort of offer indicates that there are a lot of people you know doing this at the moment, and it's uh, you know short sort of showing the return of the, the the support for him and the appreciation of him as a, of a as a player so i you know i it's 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 been very very interesting to watch since he since he made his return against Strasbourg, and uh you know i'm keen to see sort of what he can add to the mix once he gets back involved in the champions league as well uh but like i said he's going the right way about winning the fans back and for the for the most part at the moment you know the the fans are are happy to have him back and even if they're not that happy with the way that he behaved uh, over the summer still. Uh, you know, few are debating the fact that, you know, when he when he wants to play, he is a, you know, a very, very high quality player. If, if you had to put a percentage on it, 100% being he's going to be here next season, what percentage would you give for Neymar staying at PSG? Uh, at this moment in time, I'd have to say it's probably 70% likely that he won't be, uh, he won't be here next season. Obviously, you know, the rest of this campaign, uh, you know, still has a long way to go. We'll see what happens. But uh, I still think that he will feel the same way come the end of the term uh, and will want to return to, to Barcelona. We will see if they're able to, to put a better offer in front of PSG than they were this summer. Uh, I'm sure that they will probably try and, you know, make him more of a priority next summer than he was this summer. But also at the same time, you know, a lot could change, uh, you know, on the PSG end, you know, if it's a yeah. very successful season, uh, you know, who knows what will happen. But at this moment in time, I'd say I'd say from, uh, you know, sort of being like being a, a 90 percent over the summer that he that he went, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's now gone down to about 70. And obviously that could drop even further. But at this moment in time, I think it's still likely that he will move on. Uh, next summer but like I said the season is long and and plenty could change so you know let's let's watch this space see how things uh, see how things develop and uh, uh, maybe ask me that question again (laughs) sometime towards the end of the season we definitely will I don't know if you saw the reports it's Messi and PK and probably a whole host of other Barcelona players they were all talking about how in the locker room they were talking about how worried they were that Neymar would go to Real Madrid and if I'm if I'm Leonardo and Nasser I'm I'm selling them to Real Madrid. You know that they hate Barcelona, and I'm sure Real Madrid, they have money, they have players. Like, let's just sell them to uh, to Real Madrid and just piss off Barcelona even further. That's what I would do, but... <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I, you know, I, I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, selling it to, selling a player like Neymar to the club who can offer the most money and the, mm-hmm. you know, the best deal. So at the end of the day, if Real Madrid are to offer a more attractive deal than Barcelona at some point in the future, 
then I don't think PSG should should hesitate in accepting that. Uh, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, if Barcelona are in a position to put an offer in front of PSG that is similar uh, to to Real's, uh, you know, I think the chances are very high that the Neymar will favour the Barcelona return over a move to Real. Interesting. Well, those were the four questions that we had for you, but we also have more questions. You're very popular on Twitter. I put out there that we were going to do an interview with you, and we got all kinds of questions from why is water wet, which is weird, and when are you available for a drink <laughs> next week? So we didn't go with those questions, but I've got some other good ones that I thought I would fire your way, and if you want to answer just in a, in a few sentences or as long as you like. But uh, the first one comes from at PSG underscore Qatar HQ, and they would like to know, who is PSG likely to sell in the January transfer window? Draxler? And what are your thoughts on PSG acquiring Emery Chan? Uh, well, I mean, I think we we already covered a potential player who could be departing in January in Thomas Meunier, uh, and I I think that I you know I do think that he is the obvious the candidate for for making that sort of move. I mean, funnily enough, you know he's been linked with a move to Juventus with uh, PSG taking Emery Chan in um, in exchange. I, I think it would. Uh, I, I think it would be a smart move. Um, depends really on the sort of figures involved. Um, you know, I, I could see him being a useful addition to the midfield. But then again, that's all with this sort of idea in mind of pushing Marquinhos back into defence. Uh, and to be honest with you, I mean, I've, I've been a fan of Marquinhos in defensive midfield right from the off. And the more I see him playing there. Uh, you know, the more it kind of does feel like he really could have a future there. And obviously, if Marquinhos was to become a, a fixture in midfield, it makes bringing in a central defender of greater importance than it does uh, a midfielder. So obviously, that makes bringing in somebody like Chan less, uh, you know, less a, a less worthy uh, signing. But then again, if you're potentially looking at losing someone like Julian Draxler, uh, you know, PSG will need to strengthen in uh, in central midfield because although Draxler is capable of playing further up the pitch, you know he is used more often than not in a in a more central midfield role. Uh, you know Draxler is one of those frustrating players who has the talent, uh, you know has the, the the technical ability in abundance, but he just seems to ghost in and out of matches. He's sort of he's almost like the the modern day Javier Pastore. He just you know is capable of moments of brilliance, but doesn't get involved nearly often enough and you know at this moment in time also uh, you know seems like a bit of a concern in terms of, of injury uh, a lot's been made as well about the, um, the salaries earned by PSG players after the the Kaylor Navas um, wages were uh, yeah. revealed a couple of days ago and you know Draxler's up there on par with with Marco Verratti despite the fact that I feel that the Verratti brings you know so much more uh, on the pitch than, than Draxler does uh, you know consistently so uh in terms of january moves uh i think that it is a possibility that we see someone like munier moving on uh, especially if it's possible to involve him in a in a in a potential transfer that would bring somebody in who's champions league eligible uh and it wouldn't surprise me either if uh, if psg decided to move somebody like drexler on actually um other than that i think the other major moves will probably have to wait until the end of the season It'd be great if munier was moved on to marseille <laughs> I think that'd be the perfect end to this PSG story here. Uh, next, we have a, a question from what I think might be your burner account. It's from at DVNZ0R, and they want to know <laughs> if Aston Villa, which is your other favorite club, and PSG had to swap one of their players with one another, and it must be a regular starter, which swap deal would you like it to be and why? Uh, I think solely because of the the issues that I've had since the beginning of the season and not finding the the back of the net often enough I mean okay that looks like it's changing a bit at the moment with uh with the win away at Norwich and mm -hmm. and Wesley finally hitting form uh but I'd still take a striker so I'd say I mean are we arguing that the Cavani is a regular starter still because I'd take yeah. somebody like Cavani I'd take a Cavani or an Icardi a Villa uh, and if I was to send a Villa player to PSG, it would have to be Super Jack Grealish. And, you know, I'd love to see him playing, yeah. playing his trade in Paris. Um, and I'd definitely be one of the first to to buy that shirt if he ever does rock up the Parc des Princes. So uh, I'd take, I mean, I'd, yeah, I'd say I'd say I'd like to see Cavani at Villa Park. So Cavani for Grealish. I mean, Cavani to Aston Villa isn't that out of the question <laughs> this summer. I mean, 
Seems about right for him, right? At the stage of his career, he could go there. I think he could still score for Aston Villa. The th- the, the thing that I love uh, about Cavani is, he's, you know, he seems to be every man. I mean, you just see his updates when he goes back to Uruguay on holiday. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's impossible to, to, to not love the guy. Um, and I love this idea of, I mean, he's spoken a couple of times about how he'd like to finish his career in Uruguay. And I know there's the, the rumors linking him with Inter Miami and going to Major League Soccer, but... Mm-hmm. I think if he really does feel it and can give sort of, you know, two or three years at the end of his career to, to, to playing, uh, you know, back in his in his home country, uh, you know, then I'd, I'd really like to see that and see him, uh, you know, giving, giving, you know, bringing continental glory to, to a Uruguayan side uh, a go because, you know, that's something that he's spoken about in the past as being a dream of his. And, uh, you know, I think it would be... It, it, it would be I'd prefer to see that than him going back on some nostalgia trip to to somewhere like Napoli uh, or going to, to to major league soccer which as much as I can appreciate it would be a very exciting signing for for American fans uh, you know for me I'd find it more rewarding continuing to follow his his adventure if he goes back to Uruguay after PSG absolutely um, we talked about Neymar about 30 percent chance of staying throughout the um, next season, but for what what has to happen for a Neymar and Mbappe? This this question comes from at Papa Don underscore. What has to happen for Neymar and Mbappe to stay at PSG for another season? Is it simply winning, or do they need to be the highest paid footballers in the world? Is it a combination of both? Uh, I mean, I think it needs to be a lot of different things. Obviously, PSG needs to be more successful this season than they were last. Uh, I think there needs to be a greater feeling of positivity around PSG and the project. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, okay, obviously, you know, money is a is a reasonably important factor, and it's something that PSG aren't short of. So I'm sure that you know, mm-hmm. contract extensions could be sorted for both players if they decided to, if they decided to extend. But you know, that that would be the, that's the big question. You know, would uh, particularly Neymar um, and to a lesser extent Mbappe, you know, want to extend their stay with PSG at this moment in time? It doesn't seem like uh, it would be an obvious, uh, an overwhelming yes. So, you know, I think PSG need to prove that they are competitive where they where they want to be competitive this season. And obviously that means going on a good run in the Champions League. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say exactly how far they'd need to get in the Champions League to convince Neymar and Mbappe that things are starting to change and that, the, you know, the PSG project is becoming more serious. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you'd have to think that something like, a, a, you know, a Champions League semi-final uh, you know, and perhaps going out in really contentious circumstances would leave them with a feeling of of unfinished business and wanting to stay on for for one more campaign after this. But like I said, uh, at this moment in time, I don't think um, that Neymar's feelings over a, over a PSG exit will cha- will have changed that much, and he'll still be thinking that next summer he wants to make that return to Barcelona. Uh, you know, so PSG have a lot of uh, a lot of convincing to do, and uh, you know, I think as well with Neymar. PSG could still have a really successful season and he'd still really want to go. At the end of the day, it's a question of where he feels most comfortable. Um, and unless he suddenly develops a liking for uh, life in Paris, I, I don't understand why he wouldn't be that happy with it. But yeah. each to their own, uh, unless he develops a liking for, you know, for the Parisian lifestyle, uh, it's harder for me to see him staying on than, and potentially extending his contract than, than Mbappe. Yeah, I think a lot of it also has to do with Barcelona. If they have kind of a, a down season and Messi maybe doesn't look like the Messi of old and, you know, they and Griezmann never really fits in. I mean, would he even want to go to that club that's kind of more in crisis than PSG? You know, if we're on the upswing, I mean, Barcelona kind of looks like they're on a downward uh, trend here. So I think a lot also plays into that. Yeah, but also at the same time, then I think you can make the argument that Barcelona would want Neymar to come back to sort of mm-hmm. take over the mantle from Messi a bit and become their new their new mm-hmm. main man. Uh, I mean, you know, if the if the situation does arise uh, next summer where there's a possibility of Neymar returning to Barcelona again, and the situation hasn't improved with uh, you know with Antoine Griezmann at Barcelona. You know, I can think of a lot, a lot worse, uh, you know, potential deals that could be done um, than uh, than Griezmann and uh, and Neymar swap. So, you know, let's see let's see what happens there. Uh, you know, but I I don't think PSG would lose out massively if they were if they were to get someone like Griezmann in return for uh, in return for Neymar. So the last two questions I have are kind of about the same thing, so I'm going to combine them. So their Twitter handles are at jrod2589 and at salmon underscore otebi. 
So they kind of asked, wanted to know about the the Leon job that opened up. So they want to know what are your thoughts on Laurent Blanc potentially going to Leon, and then they also want to know what are your thoughts on if Arsene Wenger goes to Leon, and what would that mean to Liga? So just kind of talk about the Leon job in general. And do you think PSG's yeah. old manager could go there? Uh, you know what? I'd be interested. I'd be keen to see either of them getting back into work. Wenger and Blanc are two, two guys that I appreciate. Um, I grew to appreciate Blanc while he was in charge of PSG. It wasn't always easy. Um, but at the end of the day, I think he succeeded. Um, he was harshly dismissed. Uh, and I think PSG missed him for uh, quite a period of time. Uh, so I'd be happy to see him get back into work. I'd be curious to see, uh, you know, sort of how he fares after a reasonably long absence from the game. Uh, it's, it would also be very curious um, to see who ends up as his assistant coach because everybody knows that, uh, you know, Blanc works very well with uh, Jean-Louis Gasset, who was his assistant at PSG. Uh, there's also been rumours of uh, Franck Passy um, being his number two as well if he was to take the Lyon job. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what what happens on that front. It looks more likely that it'll be someone like Laurent Blanc than, uh, than Arsene Wenger at this moment in time. But, you know, Wenger, after everything he's done with Arsenal, I'd, I'd just be curious to know exactly what sort of project Leon would be trying to form if he was to be if he was to be the coach that they that they picked you know sort of mm-hmm. what time frame they you know it would involve because you know you can't imagine Wenger sort of investing mm-hmm. even as much as sort of five years of his uh, you know the rest of his career into into a project and you know how how much patience would the with the Leon fans have because you know Wenger is, is not going to be able to change things overnight but, you know, then there's also questions regarding whether this Lyon side, you know, requires rebuilding. Laurent Blanc said in the past, he's not a builder. You know, he's not someone who uh, reshapes these squads. He takes over um, groups of players that perhaps need one or two additions made, a few tweaks there before they're able to, to, to compete. I mean, do I think that this Lyon squad at this moment in time could compete with PSG? I don't think over the course of a season that they could compete and beat PSG to the league on title unless PSG were particularly complacent. But uh, I do think that this Lyon squad would be strong enough uh, for Blanc to lead them to second place in the table regularly. Uh, you know, and I think that that would appeal greatly um, to most Lyon fans uh, and the and you know and, and Jean Michel Aulès in that it would be a guarantee of regular Champions League football. Um, you know, and they would be, you know, second only to, to PSG and Ligue 1, which, you know, is as good as it gets for, for most other, you know, French clubs in the top flight at this moment in time, with all due respect. Uh, so I think it seems to me like Blanc is the better bet than, than Wenger. But if either of them were to, to go to Lyon, I would, I would be very keen to see, you know, sort of how it all unfolded, as I would have been very keen to see what happened with Jose Mourinho as well, before mm. Mourinho informed Lyon that he's about to take over somewhere else. So all very, all very interesting, all, uh, uh, you know, very fun possibilities. But, you know, if it's Blanc coming back to, to French football, uh, you know, I welcome him back and, and look forward to seeing what he does. And if it's Wenger, uh, you know, making a triumphant return to, to French football after a long, long time away, then, you know, I also welcome that. Uh, it would be great to have both involved, uh, you know, in Ligue 1 somewhere in some capacity uh, on a more regular basis. Um, you know, I think both guys make the uh, make the, the French domestic game uh, richer for having them. I just I struggle to see where Wenger could sort of return as a coach uh, at this, mm-hmm. you know, the, at this point in his, his career. I, I see him more as somebody who might be able to step into international management more than uh, coming back to club management. I've always said I don't know why U.S. soccer doesn't reach out to Wenger. I think it'd be great. <laughs> we could use it, that's for sure. Um, that's our last of our Twitter questions. Before we let we before we let you go, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about the piece that you're working on for us. If you want to share just a little bit of a uh, snapshot of that just to get people excited um, <laughs> and what you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it'll be a piece that, sort of combines my history as a PSG fan, sort of where my followings the, of, of the club started, uh, you know, sort of how PSG were doing at that moment in time, because this was well before the uh, the, the Qatari uh, era and the glory days. Um, and, you know, I'll be looking to sort of make an 11 with a couple of substitutes out of 
the players that I feel are probably the best um, that I've witnessed during my time as a, as, as a, as a PSG follower. And uh, you know, I think definitely think there's going to be uh, some contentious areas already, and it's uh, you know it's still an idea that's that, that, that's cooking up in my in my mind. It's it, future a few changes potentially to make uh, before it's ready to before it's ready to go live. But you know, I definitely look forward to hearing uh, what people make of uh, the players who I feel sort of define uh, you know the entire time that I've been following PSG because it will be a good mix of sort of the the pre uh the pre Qatari era and then the you know the current Qatari era players yeah it could be a few names that people maybe not as familiar with as maybe Zlatan and some of the other ones I'm sure that'll make the squad so looking forward to reading that Jonathan this has been great thank you so much for joining us and we'll have to catch you next time thanks a lot for having me on always a pleasure and uh, look forward to speaking again soon all right take care cheers bye